we're having a little technical difficulties with uh, between some programs that so we're going to get uh, Dr. Basson plugged in in just a second to do it. So, uh, so you don't have to sit there and be entirely non-involved. We're going to start. I'm going to start doing the EMS case reviews for early, which is perhaps a little bit backwards. So, we're going to talk strokes today. Dr. Basson is the uh, uh, stroke director, medical stroke director of uh, for Peace Health Southwest, and we're having a, another stroke uh, specialist from uh, Legacy Salmon Creek um, uh, after her, but uh, we'll get her presentation on soon. So, talk a little bit about your uh, about the protocol first uh, for stroke management in Clark County. And actually, uh, it's pretty much going to be the same for stroke management in all of the southwest Washington region. Uh, I'm showing you a little bit of what's going to be your new protocols. We're doing a, a protocol format change, uh, which we won't roll out officially until the end of the year. But uh, I think it makes a little bit more sense. Uh, it flows better. Um, so your stroke management, all. Uh, in our new protocol, every EMT all the way up to EMTP uh, will be following the same protocol. There won't be a basic basic protocol anymore and an intermediate protocol in advance. It'll be in stages. So you start out treating anybody with the universal patient care protocol, which is pretty standard basic stuff that you learned in EMT school. Uh, if the Glucose is low, treat per altered mental status guidelines, and that'll be a separate section. Conduct a stroke evaluation as per the BFAST and LAMS protocol, BFAST. Um, uh, and then uh, if a bleed, if a intracranial bleed is suspected, maintain normal ventilation rate and target ETCO2 at 35 millimeters. Um, why would you suspect a bleed? Sudden onset, severe headache, unconsciousness, elevated uh, uh, blood pressure, low heart rate, etc. Okay. Uh, titrate oxygen to the lowest level to achieve a 94 to 98 percent. That's our aim for all oxygen levels now. Um, reassure the patient if conscious. Okay, so here's your B fast. B, the B is balance, I, so balance, we're looking for sudden loss of balance or coordination, ataxia, if you will. Um, eyes, loss of vision in one or both eyes, or partial loss of vision. Some will say, if they have what's called a field cut, you, you say, I can't see on this side above this level. Face, you know, so classic, fast, lack of facial symmetry, arm, arms drifting or falling, speech, time, last time known normal. And then the Los Angeles Motor Score, which is the score that the uh, neurologists in the state of Washington have chosen to use. Uh, it's not the only one, but it's as accurate as any of them. So facial droop, arm drift, griff strength, and you have zero to one, zero to one, zero one, and no grip is a two. So if, if your total is above what? Where's your total? Total score above three. I want them to come in. They're going to go to the interventional stroke center. So transport emergency if the patient meets the following criteria. And here is a change. Any, posit any positive BFAS findings in the past 24 hours used to be three hours, then we moved it up to six hours, then we moved it up to eight hours, and now it's 24 hours because with, with modern 
uh, imaging techniques, we will, they, they will take up to 24 hours to intervention if indicated. The interventions that we use will be uh, looking at uh, perfusion studies to see if there's brain viability. Um, transport emergency, if there's any critical finding, profound paralysis, aphasia, comatose, and then no notify receiving facility of a code three stroke alert. Patients will be f transported to PH Southwest. Any patient with a LAMS four or five, so more than three, any patient greater than four or five, uh, any patient 80 years or older, greater, symptoms more than three hours, but less than, we have to catch that, less than 24, suspected intracranial hemorrhage, signs of, you know, s because the neurosurgeons live at P, P, peace health. Um, signs of profound paralysis, agitation, or comatose, or aphasia or comatose. Now, the, what we've been missing in strokes is aphasias. Aphasia buy you a trip to the interventional center. And take to the closest stroke center if the symptoms are three hours or less or they don't meet those above criteria. How are we doing over here? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we'll do case number one while we're waiting here. Patient is at home. Per the son, he was just talking to her and she was doing fine. No complaints, no slurring noted. He went outside to read for a while and came back in after about 15 minutes, found her on the floor, not responding, making gurgling sounds when breathing. Well, that's probably not slurring either. He called 911. He said that she'd never had this problem before, never had a stroke before. 57-year-old female on the floor, not responding, gurgling when breathing, rolled to a sheet to carry, Vomited once in the way, did not try to clear her own airway, IV placed, etomidate and sucks given, very small mouth, large tongue, first try, didn't get the tube in, uh, would have been, I mean, nature just told you that was going to be a difficult airway. Big tongue, small mouth. Um, started uh, BVM for a few minutes, then tried again with the camera and bougie, and a 7.0 tube was placed. Good waveform, CO2, secured the tube, suction had blood in it, transported, had good waveform during transport, started to fight the tube, given Versed and some fentanyl, as per protocol now. So they start bucking the tube, give them some fentanyl after this, uh, along with the Versed. And she had good ETCO2 before she was moved. Uh, that's her. Heart rate isn't very quick, so you know what her, let's see what her blood pressure was. 230 over 120, I think we have a hint here. Plus, patient is unconscious, uh, essentially comatose, GCS of three or four. Um, and uh, she moved a little when stuck with the IV, so she did, she, she is having a little bit of function there. Um, two attempts, and they used a glidescope type device, uh, uh, King Air King. Uh, CO2 is 37, blood pressure is 193 over 112, uh, re rechecked later is 219 over 133. So, okay, this was reviewed by Dr. Fedor. Um, Acute stroke-like, unresponsive patient, difficult case, vomiting. He said, I am impressed that despite the stressful situation, they had the uh, mental bandwidth and forethought to move the patient to the gurney and get a better environment for the management. We're going to be pushing in our new airway management that you, as, as often, it's very difficult, very hard for me and Marty or anyone else to try to intubate when the patient's on the floor or down low on a gurney. You, you get up and you can move around in the gurney. So we're going to try to, as much as anything, uh, encourage adequate
placement of the patient for Max, and we're going to try to get first pass success. Documentation seems to indicate the patient was an anticipated difficult airway given a small margin. So unclear whether it was discovered during the intubation attempt or was identified in advance. My guess is you found it when you tried to do the intubation. In an anticipated difficult airway, it makes sense to try to maximize first attempt, which would typically be accomplished by using uh, video laryngoscopy with or without a bougie, but I would, uh, I would encourage a bougie. We're going to push, we're going to, I bought thousands of dollars worth of bougies stock, so we have to use bougie, bougie, bougie. You should use a bougie every, literally every time you intubate. And that includes crikes. Use a finger crike and then slide the bougie in and then run your tube. Um, so we need more documentation in our intubation, but in general, this was excellent, you know, in the field. Uh, you know, first pass, sometimes you don't get the first pass, but they controlled it and did it. And the ED patient, of course, had a massive deep brain breed, lots of blood in her ventricles, non-operative by the neurosurgeon, comfort care, in the ICU, later died. So pre-hospital care was great. There's nothing much more that could have been done. So are we ready? I think so. <laughs> OK. You want to come up here and plug in? Okay, we'll make our switch here. Um, entertain the crowd while I'm doing this. Yeah, I'll entertain the crowd while a little dance. Uh, incidentally, this is, uh, I was um, thinking about this today. You know what, what day it is today? Um, and what was that 17 years ago? Um, I was doing an airway lecture at Camus and we had CNN on and saw the first plane. Oh, no, that's exciting. How about that? Can I get a hand, Rob Rowan, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen? Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so um, introduce again. Dr. Cerise Basson, who is the uh, medical director for the stroke, stroke program at Peace Health Southwest. Can I, how do I forward slides? Just click right just there. Just click right there. Okay. All right. Can everyone hear me if I don't use the microphone? Well, we, no. have to, we have to use no. the microphone because, Got it. because we have to. Are you taping, taping it? This. Yes. Got it. All right. Because I'm sort of like stuck behind the screen here. but. Um, I'll do my best. So again, I'm Cerise Basson. I'm the medical director for the stroke program at uh, Peace Health. And I want to, from uh, myself and the whole crew at Southwest, want to thank you all so much for what you do every day. You make us look good, and you make our uh, lives and our patients' lives much better. So thank you so much. Um, when uh, Lynn asked me to do a case review, I was sort of thinking about um, you know, some cases that might be illustrative of what happens after the patient gets to us. You know what happens before they get to us. Uh, what we hear often is, you know, what happened to the patient, what was their course. Um, so instead of doing a stroke program review or update, because there's not much really to update, we haven't changed too much in the last two years since we spoke, I um, thought this might be a better use of our time. So. This is a recent patient. This is not her name, but I always feel like it's helpful to have a name to make it more human. Um, but Nancy is a 50-year-old woman. Um, this is the story. She's up at 3 a.m. packing her apartment, which also I think is odd. Um, I don't know who's up packing at 3 a.m. Um, unless you're in college. Um, and the story is she got confused that she was in one room, her friend who was there was in a different room, and she re-emerged from wherever she was in the apartment and was not speaking properly. Um, 
all we know is she has a history of diabetes and CHF. So she arrives to the uh, emergency room again at 3.30 in the morning. She's alone. Um, her companion at the apartment did not arrive with her. Um, phone numbers for him uh, were returned unanswered. Uh, phones are disconnected. Her, uh, she didn't appear in our system. She wasn't in care everywhere. She wasn't in um, any of the hospital systems, which was also unusual. Some with diabetes and CHF think she's seen a doctor at some point. Um, couldn't find her name anywhere. Uh, she wasn't present enough to give us any history. Um, she had a emergency contact listed who when <laughs> the um, secretary said, hi, we're calling about Nancy Smith, said don't call me again and hung up. So, you know, probably not unexpected at 3.30 in the morning, but when a hospital calls you with um, your emergency contact being in extremis, hopefully you take the call. Um, so really we had no information on this 50-year-old woman. And again, this was our additional medical history. This was it. There's nothing else on this slide. Um, you know, I did go through the run sheet that uh, Lynn forwarded to me. Um, there's sort of no indication there of what medicines maybe were found in the uh, apartment, um, if she had a medical card. Um, it actually took us about a week to find her real name, uh, not a week, about four days to find her real name. Um, I am not sure that anything else could have been done at the scene to get us more medical information, but we were really stymied um, in terms of treatment when she arrived because we didn't know if she maybe just had, you know, a massive GI bleed a week ago. So she got to the ER, her head CT was normal. She presented with um, neglect and a hemiparesis on the left, which is completely flaccid. Um, CTA showed, um, is there a pointer here? Okay, that's fine. Um, so this is she, uh, again, since we didn't have any medical history, we could not offer her TPA even though she was well within three hours um, from the time that she presented with these deficits. Um, fortunately, we had an interventionalist on that night and the CTA did show an M1 occlusion that you can see here on the angiogram. This is from the cath lab. This is her carotid and her MCA, and it just cuts off right there. And after five passes with a device to ensnare the clot, um, she had restoration of almost normal flow. You can see the difference there. Um, unfortunately, it was five passes. Um, that's just the way it goes sometimes. There was nothing else that um, it could have been done. Again, we could not give her TPA. Sometimes if you can give someone TPA before they go to the cath lab, it softens the clot. And so when the interventionalist goes in to retrieve it, it's one or two passes because they don't have to take it out chunk by chunk. It's all sort of uh, gelatinous and sticks to the, um, the retrieval device. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so five passes took about two hours. Um, so we were expecting her to have um, a decent sized stroke, but she goes to the um, ICU. Uh, she hasn't had any improvement in her function, but she is awake. She'll follow commands. She's hemiparetic. Uh, she starts getting her evaluation. Why would a 50-year-old woman, even with CHF and diabetes, have a massive stroke? And first thing we find is on her echo, you can see here she's got an EF of 20%. Uh, we knew she had CHF, but again, someone with 20%, you'd think you'd find a record about them seeing a doctor at some point in their life. Um, so what are the reasons that someone who's 50 uh, has an EF of 20% other than just terrible, terrible luck. Yep, I heard someone whisper it. <laughs> uh, close, uh, meth. So uh, methamphetamine use. 
Yeah, exactly. That, that does give you motivation to pack at 3 a.m., I, I have heard. Um, so uh, tox screen is positive for um, methamphetamines. Um, as you know, methamphetamines are rampant in this area and uh, use over time, especially in someone with a hemoglobin A1C of nearly 11, um, really affects the cardiac function. And we see this not infrequently. Young patients, um, especially with any other pre-existing condition, hypertension, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, where your blood vessels are probably not pristine, um, the heart really takes a hit. So you see people coming in with an EF of 20%, 15%, 10%. Amazingly, you know, up at three in the morning packing, which you'd think with an EF of 20%, you wouldn't feel like doing much. But um, unfortunately, this is why this 50-year-old came in with this problem. This was her initial head CT. Uh, you can see, this was not, I'm sorry, this was after her um, embolectomy. You can see this is uh, the midline. She shifted over. You can see comparing the right to the left, she's got this little area here of hypodensity and another one here, which is the stroke. And then this area here that's a little brighter, um, that is probably contrast from the angiogram that sort of extravasates a little bit into this dead tissue. So it can look like blood, but really that's just a little contrast that leaked in there. Um, at the point of this scan, she is, again, she's awake, she's following commands, um, but still hemiplegic. The biggest concern, young person, um, is young people have nice full brains. If she was 85 and had this, there's essentially no chance that her swelling is going to be life-threatening. 80-year-olds have a lot of atrophy, there's room to swell, 50-year-olds do not. So this is day one, and you can see already she's got some swelling. The concern, of course, is that uh, our options were a bit limited to manage her swelling. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. This is day two after her stroke, uh, and you can see now she actually has a little bit of actual hemorrhage here, this little dot, and her shift is definitely worse. She's really pushed over. Um, she's probably about seven or eight millimeters pushed over. Um, and we were very concerned. But again, you go with the clinical exam. She's awake. She's uh, uh, doing as well as she was when she came in. Um, so Monroe Kelly Doctrine, does anyone know what that refers to? probably reaching back to that basic medical education. So when we think about how do we treat ICP, you want to think about the Monroe Kelly Doctrine. And basically what this says is that in a fixed space, which is the skull, that the components, the volume of the components stay constant. There are three components. That's it. You've got blood, you've got brain, and you've got CSF. So the only three components in, inside the vault. When you are managing ICP, you want to think about the maneuver you're using and which component you're affecting. So it's, you can see in this picture, a couple things I want to point out. Venous volume is larger than the arterial volume in the intracranial cavity. I'll get back to that in a moment when we talk about um, hyperventilation treatment. Then you have your brain volume, then you have mass. Mass can be a tumor, it can be a hematoma, it can be swelling, and then you have CSF. So if you have higher ICP, what can you do? To keep this uh, volume the same, um, here you've got now mass, taking up some of that volume, the arterial volume stays the same. The first thing is your venous volume can come down, and then your CSF can be decreased. And those are what are called compensatory measures that if you did nothing, if you weren't involved at all, the brain would do that itself. 
okay, your venous volume will go down, and the CSF gets sort of pushed out down around the spinal cord. But can only compensate for so long. At some point, there's no more CSF to be pushed out. There's no more venous blood to be pushed out. You push out too much arterial blood, you have more strokes. And so what happens is, you can see here, your venous blood gets smaller, your CSF volume gets smaller, compensate, compensate, compensate to a point where the ICP goes up and you herniate, okay? So what you're trying to do is with your maneuvers, so which we'll talk about in a second, such as um, mannitol, hypertonic saline, hyperventilation, you are trying to keep the patient compensated before they become decompensated and have herniation. All right, so what are your options? Positioning. So positioning means keeping the head midline, head of bed up. Um, which component? Blood, brain, CSF, does that affect? By positioning the patient, which of those components will decrease? Anyone? Possibly on a small scale. Possibly on a small scale. It's blood. It's your venous blood, okay, which is the biggest blood component in the intracranial vault. Position, if you have someone turn like this, you can't have great venous return, okay? Um, if someone's flat, they're not gonna have great venous return. So simply positioning the patient with high ICP, head midline, if they have a collar on, you wanna make sure it's not too tight. Um, patients, as you know, that are um, you know, comatose, they often are leaned over like this. You wanna put a pillow under, you really want that head midline and you want the head of bed up. Just positioning the patient um, really can decrease ICP significantly by getting that venous blood out of the brain, back into the heart, and into the venous system centrally. Um, but obviously positioning is not enough. So sometimes we use hyperventilation. I know that uh, Lynn spoke to that a little bit in the protocol, the stroke protocol, saying you wanna keep the CO2 35 to 40. So 35 to 40 is a normal CO2. That's not hyperventilated which is good. How does hyperventilation work to decrease ICP? Is it, does it make the brain smaller? Does it make the CSF volume lower? Does it make the blood volume lower? I will give you the answer. <laughs> it, is, it makes the blood volume lower, specifically the arterial blood volume lower. So if you remember that first slide where it showed the venous blood is a bigger volume than the arterial blood, that's why hyperventilation works, but it doesn't work very well because there's not that much arterial blood in the brain. So what happens is when you hyperventilate someone, the pH changes. So it's not the CO2 that the chemoreceptors C, it's actually the pH in the CSF. So when the pH in the CSF changes, the blood vessels react to that pH by constricting. So it's those arterial vessels constrict, decreasing the blood volume, and that's why ICP goes down. But what happens when you decrease arterial blood volume? Too much. This is what happens. So this is a, a group in Cambridge who studies this, and I personally think this is kind of cool research. This is someone with a CO2 of 35. Um, obviously, this patient has a problem. This had a trauma. You can see they have a lot of swelling. Take a CO2 of 35, which is normal, and hyperventilate them down to a CO2 of 26. You can see here cerebral blood flow, black, is bad, that is ischemic areas of brain. You can see when you decrease someone's CO2 from 35 to 26, the areas of brain that are having ischemic levels of cerebral blood flow increase about five-fold. So does it work to decrease ICP? It does, it's temporary, and there's a risk that you're causing more ischemic brain if you do it long-term. So that's why hyperventilation is 
you're, if you have an ICP monitor, you're going to see that ICP go down. But if you also have an oxygen monitor in the brain, you're also going to see your oxygen level in your brain go down, which doesn't make you feel very good. So short-term and long-term hyperventilation is something you want to use with caution. How about osmotic agents, mannitol, hypertonic saline? Um, these work great. The way they work, as you know, is you have an intact blood-brain barrier. You have uh, your mannitol or hypertonic saline, same thing that's represented here in green. If your blood-brain barrier is intact, there's water molecules from the brain um, will be you know, sucked into the blood volume space. So this actually is the one treatment that affects the brain volume itself. Okay, so let's say you can't affect the blood volume, you can't affect the CSF volume, you want to affect brain volume. Osmotic agents really are the way to do it. So you can see here the brain volume is a little smaller, blood volume is a little bigger. The problem is that this requires an intact blood-brain barrier. Someone who has trauma, someone who has a stroke, their blood-brain barrier by definition is not intact. And so what can happen, somewhat theoretical, is that these proteins, the mannitol or, or even just saline, hypertonic saline, if your blood-brain barrier is not intact, will actually infiltrate into the brain tissue, okay? So in the normal areas of brain, the mannitol's working properly, but in the damaged areas of brain, the mannitol's going into the brain tissue. Three days later, the patient's getting better, your blood-brain barrier is reestablishing itself. Now, the direction is reversed. So you can get something called um, rebound intracranial hypertension. So for three days, the patient looks great, they're getting mannitol, they're getting hypertonic saline, and then for some reason, now their swelling is much worse in areas of the brain that you didn't expect. And so that's the theory is that these protein molecules that are supposed to stay in the blood volume, because the blood-brain barrier is intact, are moving exactly where you don't want them. So again, unfortunately, great treatment, but it is somewhat limited. With this patient, oh, we'll go through that. With this patient, uh, unfortunately, that was really all we had. Um, she was not intubated initially, so hyperventilation would have been out. Um, positioning, of course, was um, instituted. Um, she got hypertonic saline um, instead of mannitol. The concern was that mannitol um, would increase her blood volume to a point that her heart wouldn't be able to tolerate it. Um, her <laughs> sodium actually was pushed up from normal to uh, the 170s, which is too high. Um, ventricular drain also. Great treatment. Um, with this particular patient, and I'll show you her scan in a second, there was nowhere to put a drain. You remember that picture? The only open space was on the left. If you decrease the pressure on the left, the pressure from the right is just going to keep pushing over to the left, which is exactly what we didn't want with her. Um, and then lastly, if you exhaust all those options, so you've decreased your blood volume as much as you can, you decrease your brain volume as much as you can, you decrease your CSF volume as much as you can, you have to make the vault bigger, right? You can, so you take off a piece of skull and do a duroplasty, open up the skull to make more room. A patient with 20% EF, that is the last thing you wanna do is take them to the operating room if you don't absolutely have to. There's also very um, long-standing good data. These are three trials. This is about 10 years ago. Patients with malignant strokes saying, do we take patients with malignant strokes, big MCA strokes to the operating room, prophylactically take off the skull? Um, and the data says that yes, in a young patient, with a non-dominant, so usually on, that's on the right, so non-dominant hemisphere stroke, that taking the skull off will prevent death and limit disability. 
this has been brought into question in uh, countless studies, but these are the three biggest studies. Um, what we don't know is the timing. That's the problem is that do you do it on day one? Do you wait until the patient looks like they're deteriorating a little bit? Patient whose EF is 20%, is it worth it? If she's talking and isn't really any worse, no one knows the answer to those questions. But in general, if we have a young patient who is healthy with a big MCA stroke, we take them very early in the first 24 hours to do a very large hemicraniectomy. You let the brain swell out and then the bone goes back on some point in the future if they survive. So again, this was her scan. I don't know why it's showing up that way, but anyway, this is her scan. Um, on day about three, she all of a sudden got much worse. She was no longer following command. Had a repeat scan, and you can see here she actually had an additional stroke while she was in the hospital. So now the she has a stroke on the left, and I couldn't get all the images in there, but it really was almost a lot of the left hemisphere, her temporal lobe, her frontal lobe. And the presumption is that with that EF of 20%, she was embolizing from her heart, even though her echo did not show a mural thrombus. Uh, so she was intubated, again, uh, hypertonic saline, uh, but unfortunately, uh, did deteriorate and was declared dead by neurologic criteria, which is the same as brain death, um, on day four. Um, you know, she was a tough case because she is a young, was a very young woman. Um, she had several children. Um, you know, I think the take home points from this um, are many. Um, the first three are really not in jest. <laughs> Um, my point of putting those in there is that sometimes everything goes perfectly and the patient's just too sick. There's nothing we can do about their medical history, uh, but we do the best we can and treat every patient as aggressively as is appropriate. Um, but in neurology, especially acute neurology, history is everything. So I just want to re-implore you that if um, there's anything that we can use that you find at the scene, pill bottles, um, you know, a medical card, a human being that knows the patient that can come with you. Because what happens is the patient says, the patient goes with you, the person who witnessed the event says, I'll, I'll be there in 10 minutes. Either they don't show up, you can't find them, they tell you to, you know, go do you know <laughs> what when you call them at three in the morning? Um, we were left with a patient who can't tell us their history and our options become very limited. So please um, continue to do what you're doing to get as much medical history and corroborating um, human <laughs> input as possible. Um, and then lastly, ICP is nuanced, but it is logical if you think about uh, the Monroe Kelly Doctrine. You have blood, brain, CSF, and skull. Those are the only four moving parts. Uh, and think about your treatments logically. If you've already addressed one of those components, move on to a treatment that will adjust the volume of a different component. And that's all I have today for you. Uh, any questions? Yes. Um, you talked about patient position mm -hmm. in the face of ICP. Sure. Sure. Um, most of the cases that we bring in, we do bring in in some, at some level of elevated, except for unconscious patients. Mm -hmm. Probably would be the one that could seem to be most painful for some reason. Mm -hmm. Is that something you should make an effort to do? It is possible to elevate unconscious patients, but it does require a little more time. Yeah. So do you usually just have them flat supine? Yeah. I mean, Right, right. I mean, I don't know enough about the setups and the rigs and the beds and the gurneys and what their capabilities are. I think from my standpoint, if you are able to, you know, even put them in reverse Trendelenburg so their head is up a little bit, um, you know, that's, 
that's always helpful when someone has increased ICP. But again, like you said, you don't know, right? So if you have someone with an acute stroke, um, we actually sometimes put their head down because we want to increase blood flow. So I think you're unfortunately really stymied by not knowing what's going on in the head. I would say if you have a trauma patient, um, I always try to keep their head of the bed, you know, at reverse Trendelenburg if you don't know what the spine uh, stability is. Um, but I'm speaking out of turn that this is definitely a safety issue for the ER guys. Right. Yeah. I mean, hopefully. No, no, no. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, for the for the short uh, ride in the in the rig, I wouldn't worry too much about it. But you certainly could, you know, do what you're doing with keeping the patient's head midline, making sure that the collar is not on too tight. Um, you know, if you have a patient that is not intubated and is moving around to try to remind them, you know, keep their head straight. But I think there's only so much you can do with the equipment you have. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, no, that, I'd like to second that. Um, what we often hear is um, this patient, the time of onset was for this patient, 3, 3 a.m. But what you really want to dig down into is when was the last time the patient was normal? So if the friend was there, what I would have asked him is, when did you last see her? I know you found her like this at 3 a.m., but did you last see her normal and talking to you at 2, at 1, at midnight? That's the last known normal time. That's the time we have to go on. If he says, I saw her at you know, 2.30 and she was fine, 2.30 is the time. So if you can think of it, not only get the time the patient was found in their altered state, but the last time they were seen and they were known normal, that's really critical information and it's so helpful. Thank you for bringing that up. Any other questions? Anything? All right. Thanks so much Thank for you. your uh, attention and again for your hard work. We really appreciate it. As the six hospitals under his uh, directorship. And Chris. Good morning. I'm Christy Item. I'm the store coordinator for Legacy Salmon Creek. So I'm going to just start all, um, and just talk a little bit about um, our program that we have at Salmon Creek, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Freeberg to talk about stroke. So we're a primary uh, stroke center, which basically just means we can initiate uh, the treatment um, for any of our stroke patients. Uh, we're certified by Joint Commission. Um, we can initiate um, IVTPA, um, and then we can complete treatment uh, with our patients. Uh, we average uh, about 400 pa stroke patients a year that we um, provide care for. Um, we just don't have um, endovascular capability for thrombectomies, and so that's what then qualifies us as the stroke level two uh, with Washington State. State EMS and allows you guys to bypass our center um, if the patient uh, looks like they have a large vessel occlusion, but otherwise we're able to provide that care. We've just recently become a covered all partner hospital, which is a CDC program um, that uh, increases awareness of stroke, um, and so we are able to do some community engagement 
um, and some education. It also provides um, a database uh, for state and national level um, that we contribute data to so we can benchmark ourselves with other hospitals. Um, and now um, the uh, state of Washington is now trying to engage EMS partners uh, with that process and looking at benchmarking some data for you guys to be able to use that for process improvement um, and look at some outcomes for your patients. So I'm very excited to participate in that program. Um, so kind of our overall uh, program, we have Dr. Jitsi who manages our program at the system level. Um, we have um, Dr. Freeberg who is our neurohospitalist um, and then also um, is our stroke program manager at the hospital level. We do have 24-7 neurology coverage. Uh, we do that by telemedicine. They can log in remotely and uh, see our patients any time of the day um, if they're not on site. Um, we do a lot of data management. <clears throat> both at the system level as well as our site level to look at ways to um, improve our care of our patients. Um, and then kind of at a system level, then we have the oversight of providing continuing education for all of our staff hospital-wide. We also provide uh, case reviews. Um, uh, oftentimes that is just at the uh, site level, but then, um, like for me, I provide uh, case reviews if you guys bring patients in and we actually do provide treatment for those patients. Um, so just kind of a, a quick overview of how our patients um, arrive. Uh, we have a large volume that come in by private vehicle. Um, but So there's an opportunity for a lot of uh, patient education. So if they have to come back in, we really encourage them to call 911 and come in as soon as possible because um, it is really important kind of in our treatment algorithms to get them as quickly as possible. Um, so you can kind of see that's our, our biggest goal right now. Um, we have seen kind of a stable process for how they arrive. So if you guys haven't seen one of these, this is a case study of what I provide your training officers when you guys bring in a case um, that we treat uh, with IV TPA. Um, I try to just give kind of a brief overview of how the patient presented um, and how quickly they got there um, and how quickly we were able to implement treatment. So this was a good example of one that we actually got um, a pre-arrival notification um, from the crew. Um, we had the team there and ready by the time the patient got there. We went right to CT um, and we were able to give IV TPA our door to uh, needle time was 37 minutes. Uh, our goal is really less than 45 so we met our target with that. Um, and our patient actually had a um, fantastic recovery with this. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys some examples of kind of what that looked like. This is an example of a patient um, that we did not get a pre-arrival um, notification on. So our um, door to needle time was a little bit longer. It was 60 minutes um, because we didn't have the team there. We um, got called um, after the patient had been there. Um, the patient had some um, symptoms that kind of waxed and waned and Dr. Freeberg will talk a little bit more about that. Um, as far as um, how that's important. So I just wanted to kind of highlight um, how important it is um, to give us that um, heads up notice because um, every minute does count with these patients. And that's it for my section. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Freeberg. Thanks to you, Christy. So I was asked to give kind of a broad overview of acute ischemic stroke. It's a big topic. Um, and so these are just kind of broad strokes, but hopefully there's some good takeaway points. So we'll talk about uh, kind of presenting symptoms and, uh, and treatment of acute stroke. Um, just briefly, uh, stroke, as you probably know, is uh, very common. There are 15 million strokes per year worldwide, and one third of those, five million die. Um, another third, five million, are left permanently disabled from their strokes. So it's a major cause of disability worldwide. Number two cause of death in the U.S., number, f or number uh, five cause of death in the U.S. overall. And there is this kind of uh, uh, predile predilection for um, the southern states is kind of called the stroke belt and maybe there's more tobacco and other risk factors in that area but we certainly have our share of strokes in the northwest. Um, as far as types of stroke, um, you know, when people say stroke, they include hemorrhagic and ischemic. Today we're only talking about ischemic strokes, and that does constitute the majority of stroke patients we see. This is Washington State data overall, about 85% of strokes are ischemic strokes. Um, and so the general role of EMS, as I was kind of hearing uh, from the last presentation as well, it's, it's uh, you know, we rely on you to identify uh, possible strokes very early on in the field, um, obtain the past medical history, the last known well, which is so important, any uh, medication list or bottles that are available at the time, um, you know, check a blood glucose because that can, a low blood sugar can be a mimicker of stroke and it should also be corrected because it uh, worsens stroke outcome. And then, you know, a pulsed form if it's available, family contact info is also very, very helpful. 
um, because we often need to speak to the family if the patient uh, can't consent for themselves if we're going to do a procedure. Um, and then we, of course, rely on you for rapid transport to uh, the most appropriate stroke center. Um, and so just pulled a couple things out of the AHA stroke guidelines um, regarding EMS care. Uh, they say to, this is what was just updated this February, to increase both the number of patients who are treated and quality of care educational stroke programs um, are recommended. So that's what we're all doing today. And then uh, next bullet point is that EMS personnel should provide pre-hospital notification to the receiving hospital that a suspected stroke patient is en route because that has been shown to improve treatment times. And that's class one level B, which is a strong recommendation. So that's uh, definitely something that we appreciate uh, you guys doing. Um, so as far as that pre-hospital uh, pre stroke identification, um, you should uh, be confident in, uh, in your uh, diagnosis of stroke. So the data are that as far as a 911 call, the dispatcher um, from taking the call suspecting that a patient had a stroke, the positive predictive value for, for their suspicion is about 34 to 51 percent uh, that that patient ends up having a diagnosis of stroke uh, when they actually leave the hospital. And as far as ambulance personnel, it's even higher that uh, positive predictive value is about 58 percent. So it's about three in five times that you're thinking this patient uh, probably had a stroke, you're right. So um, trust your instincts and any sudden neurological deficit could be acute stroke. Um, so just to, to back up a little bit, uh, what is ischemic stroke? You know, this can, uh, it, it's kind of the end result of many different things, but in general, it's blockage of an artery, which therefore compromises blood flow downstream. And without any blood flow, there's no oxygen, and without oxygen, tissue dies relatively quickly. So this is just kind of a blown up cartoon of a little piece of uh, cholesterol plaque blocking an artery, and this dark area is the territory that's not getting blood flow or oxygen. So many, many things can block arteries. Um, this is just a list of some of the things that can compromise blood flow. Um, we like to group stroke etiologies uh, in this way, um, small vessel disease, large artery atherosclerosis, cardioembolic strokes, and other. It's not as important uh, to know these today um, because, you know, strokes can present the same way regardless of the mechanism, but um, the small vessel disease uh, tends to be damaged to small arteries over time from things like high blood pressure or micro deposits of plaque. Large artery atherosclerosis is more like what we think of in the carotids or large vessels in the brain with a buildup of cholesterol plaque that uh, narrows an artery. And then uh, the other big category is cardioembolic strokes, which is a blood clot um, coming from the heart for whatever reason, atrial fibrillation, an artificial valve. It could also be a clot mixed with bacteria from endocarditis, et cetera. And then, you know, makes its way to the brain and blocks an artery. And then there's, there's many other more rare causes of stroke as well, um, just to kind of keep them in mind. Um, things like vasospasm, sudden narrowing of arteries, dissections, inflammatory arteritis, um, they can all end up causing stroke too. But uh, in any case, the end result is blockage of a blood vessel. And uh, this is one of the more common causes is uh, large or smaller artery atherosclerosis. So I'll just show you a little uh, depiction of that. So here's a normal arterial wall, um, the three layers of the arterial wall, inside, middle, and outer layer. And uh, over time, uh, cholesterol plaque can build up within the inner and middle wall. Um, that plaque can become unstable and rupture, uh, as you see in this picture. So bits of this ruptured plaque can go downstream and block a smaller vessel and cause a stroke. Or you can start to develop a blood clot on this unstable plaque. It's a very inflammatory area, platelets clump, and, uh, and a clot can form right there. That clot can kind of grow to the point that it completely occludes the artery right in place. Or this clot or mix of clot and plaque can break off and go downstream. Um, so this is, you know, one of the more common causes of stroke, either in place or embolizing distally. And in any case, what can we do about it? How do we open the artery back up? Um, and uh, that, that's when we get to treatment. So time is brain with this process. When, you, when blood flow has suddenly ceased, every minute counts. Uh, estimates are that for every minute, uh, 1.9 million neurons are lost, or 14 billion synapses, which is kind of hard to comprehend, but big numbers. Um, this one uh, article looked at, you know, with aging, the brain kind of naturally atrophies. They looked at uh, stroke equivalent to aging. So every minute uh, of a stroke is equivalent to 3.1 weeks of aging or every hour equivalent to 3.6 years of aging. Um, so this damage happens very quickly. Early identification and treatment to reopen that vessel is critical. 
Um, so I wanted to go over some of the more common um, stroke syndromes and relate them to the BFAST acronym that, uh, that we teach each other and uh, even our patients. Um, so hopefully, I'm, I'm sure you've all seen this or something like it before, BFAST is the acronym that we're, uh, we're teaching everyone these days. So the B is for balance, sudden loss of balance or dizziness, unsteadiness. E is for eyes, a sudden loss of vision. F is for face, facial droop. A is for arm weakness. Uh, S is for speech, either th slurred speech or trouble uh, speaking, trouble getting words out. Um, and then the T is for time to call 911. Um, so let's break those down a little bit. Uh, just a little refresher here, the, the different four lobes of the brain. Um, this is the front of the brain and the back of the brain in the cerebellum and brain stem. And we'll come back to this. But so here are the arteries feeding the brain. Uh, this is the same picture as before, and it's actually very anatomically correct. Um, so these are the common carotids. Can you, can you see my mouse there? Yeah. Internal carotid arteries um, going up to become the uh, two arteries that feed the whole front part of the brain or anterior circulation. And then you have the two vertebral arteries back here that feed the brain stem and then join together to make the basilar artery. And, uh, and then it ends up becoming the posterior cerebral arteries. So there are three main arteries in the brain anterior, middle, and posterior. Anterior and middle come off the carotids, posterior comes off of the posterior circulation of vertebrals and basilar. Um, and if you put a little brain in there, these are the rough territories that they feed. Um, anterior cerebral artery uh, feeds this kind of front part of the brain, MCA, this large territory on the side, and then PCA is mostly the occipital lobe. Um, here's that picture again and then the brain uh, cut in half, so you're, this is the middle of the brain, the ACA, just wanted to show you feeds the whole middle of the brain too. And this is all uh, kind of interesting when it comes to why people present the way they do. So um, let's talk about that first part of the BFAST acronym, BALANCE. Um, the part of your brain that uh, can processes uh, balance is the cerebellum and parts of the brain stem. The blood supply there, as we talked about, branches of the vertebral and basilar arteries. Um, so in this area, it controls your balance, eye movements, uh, cranial nerves are in the brainstem controlling facial movement, et cetera. And then the uh, connection from the brain to the spinal cord runs through here. So um, all of your uh, motor tracks controlling your strength and uh, sensation going back up to the brain uh, go through the brainstem as well. So posterior circulation stroke symptoms, the big ones uh, included in the B are balance, unsteadiness, vertigo, sudden nausea and vomiting. Um, often associated with slurred speech and facial droop or some cranial nerve symptoms at the same time. And then uh, these syndromes can come along with weakness or numbness of the extremities. And the next part of the acronym was eyes. And uh, so this really localizes to the occipital lobe. Really the only function uh, of this area is the visual cortex processing your vision. So a stroke here can present with uh, vision loss and vision loss only. So sudden loss of vision on one side is concerning for an occipital stroke, which would be a blockage of that one uh, posterior cerebral artery we talked about. Um, and then the next three, face, arm, and speech, are kind of cool because they often uh, go together. They can you know, occur individually, but I wanted to just kind of make the point that these are all included in the, uh, in the MCA territory. So this is the left side of the brain, it's looking forward. And they, uh, this is from uh, the American Stroke website, actually. It's a cool picture. But so this is the primary motor cortex in orange and sensory cortex in blue. And uh, right here, what we call Broca's area, is, uh, controls your expressive speech and Wernicke's area, your receptive or understanding of speech. These two areas are, are right here in the territory as well. So an MCA stroke includes all of this. Um, you'll get weakness on the opposite side and, uh, and facial droop and trouble speaking. Um, and, you know, you actually get weakness primarily in the face and arm. And so I wanted to show you this cool picture if you haven't seen it before. It really helps to visualize why that's the case. So remember the ACA, anterior cerebral artery, feeds the middle part of the brain here and the MCA, the whole kind of outer surface. So um, the top, topographical representation of the body and the brain is, is such where the leg and knee kind of go down the midline of the brain, and then the hand and face and mouth are out here on the side. So this is why with an MCA stroke, we often see facial droop and arm weakness, but the leg strength is preserved. Um, and so that constellation, facial droop, arm weakness, slurred speech or trouble getting words out is uh, pathognomonic, as we say, for an MCA stroke. 
And then we can see a, an ACA stroke too. Sometimes people, all they present with is a sudden loss of weakness in the leg. That too uh, should raise a big red flag that, that that could be blockage of the ACA territory. Of course, if somebody has a huge stroke um, and the carotid is blocked, you know, all of the above can happen at the same time. But these are just the common syndromes and kind of why we present them this way to patients. This is a busy slide, but it kind of also helps to illustrate why this is uh, the case, that um, this is uh, demonstrating the percentage of cerebral blood flow through each of the arteries in kind of a cool study where they measure each one in, um, individually. And uh, first of all, I want to point out total cerebral blood flow is about 700 milliliters per minute. So, you know, about three quarters of a liter, if you think of a one liter bottle, every minute is circulating through your brain. And, um, you know, the majority of that as far as the carotids and vertebrals, the majority of that is the anterior circulation going up the carotids. But then inside the brain, each MCA accounts for about 21% of blood flow. So together, the MCAs alone account for about 42% of the blood flow in the brain. And that's why the most common location for stroke is, is MCA territory, just simply because that's where most of the blood goes, and that's where most of the clots are going to go as well um, that embolize from anywhere else. Um, and so that's, that's why we focus so much on face, arm, and speech, why it's part of the you know, pre-hospital triage scales, because left MCA is just a common place to have a stroke, or right MCA, either MCA. I'll also point out in people who are right-handed, their speech is on the left side. So with a left MCA stroke, they also just have trouble understanding words, but they wouldn't necessarily have that on the other side. So to recap um, these BFAST stroke syndromes, um, as far as the balance, um, localizing the cerebellum and brainstem, any patient presenting with acute vertigo, just sudden dizziness, unsteady gait, ataxia, clumsiness of the, the legs or nausea and vomiting should raise a red flag. Um, you know, sometimes we find out that it's something else going on, an inner ear problem, but from your standpoint, um, these, if they're sudden and severe, should be considered a stroke until proven otherwise, especially if it comes along with anything else like slurred speech or any weakness or numbness, for sure. Um, occipital lobe can just present with isolated vision loss, um, and so that's always concerning if that happens suddenly. And then MCA strokes, face and arm weakness um, and numbness, and uh, plus or minus aphasia, depending on which side it's on. Are those all the stroke syndromes? Of course not. If there were, uh, if that was it, then I wouldn't have to spend the next two months studying for my boards. Um, but there are many other ways that strokes can present, and the key takeaway is any sudden neurological deficit uh, can potentially be an acute ischemic stroke. Other common ways that people present uh, strokes that happen kind of deeper in the brain that uh, hit the white matter tracts where they're all kind of running together um, can present with weakness or numbness, uh, one or the other or together on an entire side of the body, that's common. Less common, I'll just point out some other things that definitely can uh, be stroke, which you know, I even myself have seen many times. Brainstem strokes can cause sudden hoarse voice, changes in voice, refractory hiccups even in certain brainstem strokes, hearing loss, pupillary changes. Um, thalamic strokes can cause sudden decreased arousal, sudden coma with no other symptoms. They can also cause people's personality to change. We just had a patient recently who had a, a stroke in one particular part of the thalamus that's known for causing confabulation. And this patient was just making up stories about what was happening and, and what she'd been doing. Um, that uh, it was clearly something that was abnormal and the, the family identified it and brought her in and she did have an acute stroke. Um, and then, you know, temporal lobe, memory loss, uh, frontal lobe, personality behavior changes. The key to these is sudden. You know, if an 80 year old woman has a fever and, you know, urinary uh, pain, in, for three days and she's confused, that's not a stroke. But if, sudden, if somebody suddenly presents with any neurologic change with, with no other explanation and it's uh, you know, not their, their baseline, it could be an acute ischemic stroke. Um, so transitioning into the treatment, what can we do once it has been identified? Starts with you guys, supportive care, the ABCs, um, and then IVTPA is our standby, which has been around for a couple decades. And then uh, more recently, the standard of care mechanical thrombectomy for eligible patients. So the ABCs, um, you know, stroke being a lack of blood flow and a lack of oxygen, it's even worse if the patient's blood pressure is low or if their oxygenation is low. So uh, also one of the recommendations in the guidelines is to keep oxygen saturation above 94%. If they're hypoxic, put them on oxygen. Um, you know, if they're uh, unable to clear their airway because the secretions are decreased level of consciousness, they need to be intubated, obviously. And then as far as blood pressure, it turns out, you know, high blood pressure or low blood pressure 
um, um, can be bad if it's extremely high or extremely low. And so we kind of let people uh, auto-regulate or do their own thing within this reasonable middle range. Um, we let the blood pressure, as you may know, go all the way up to 220 over 120 in patients who are not receiving TPA or 180 over 5 in patients who've gotten TPA. Um, we like to avoid hypotension and hypovolemia. If people are hypotensive, blood pressure less than 100, we generally recommend uh, repleting them with fluids, but there's no real study to guide how much or how long. But this is an interesting graph that just kind of illustrates this. It was taken from the original, um, one of the original stroke studies uh, showing mortality rate on this axis versus blood pressure. And so in this range of kind of 100 to 220, pretty much the same, over 220, you can get all kinds of other problems um, like bleeding into the brain, um, hypertensive encephalopathy, renal problems. Less than 100, and you can get systemic hypoperfusion and organ failure. So really, pay people do much worse if their blood pressure is low or high, and we like to just let them uh, be anywhere in that in-between range. So once they get to the hospital, TPA is our um, you know, first consideration for people that are potential candidates. And you know, we know from many studies now that TPA improves functional outcome. Here's a nice graphical representation of this. Um, you may have heard of the modified Rankin scale, not to get too uh, deep into it, but it's just a, a scale uh, reflecting functional ability. It starts at zero being normal uh, to six being dead, and then in between one is just mild symptoms, two mild uh, disability but still independent. Uh, three, they can still walk. Four, they cannot walk. Five is bedridden, people who are basically constant uh, nursing care. And so this uh, graph here shows, per the major TPA trials, um, the three-month outcome of people who got TPA. Um, these 65 um, versus not getting treatment. These 65 did not um, have any uh, improvement because, like due to the TPA. Um, whereas over here, uh, the dark green is people who moved up three levels on the scale. So that could be going from you know, moderate disability to normal, or not able to walk to very mild symptoms. So that's, that's significant. So eight went up three levels, uh, eight two levels, 16 one level. Um, so a good percentage of patients will improve because of TPA, and then unfortunately because of side effects, mainly being bleeding, there are a few who will worsen as well. This is sort of better, oh, I'll show another one in a second. This better represented another graph. Um, this is another uh, way of showing the same thing, that in patients who just got placebo, um, this was their NIH stroke scale down the road at three months versus TPA. So you, just, you see more people in the minimal symptoms category and fewer people in the severe death category. That's the takeaway. And uh, this is kind of a cool graph. This is what I use when I'm uh, consenting a patient for TPA or their family member. I show them this chart, which is 100 little people who are having a stroke who got TPA within three hours. Um, and the dark green ones are the people who are back to normal. The green ones are people who are better but not completely normal. Um, there, so 32 people are better or normal. Um, 64, I think, in the, or 62 in the middle um, didn't get better or worse. And then here are the ones that had some adverse effect. The ones that are clear with just a minus had um, some minimal symptoms that were not significant, uh, but like, uh, asymptomatic bleeding. The dark red ones um, had some bleeding that made them worse, and then the one dark red one here in the middle actually dies. So one out of 100 people who gets TPA will have severe enough bleeding in their brain or their gut or elsewhere that they die from it. We try to pick you know, patients in ways that we minimize that risk as best we can, but still, if you're having a disabling stroke, you're not going to be able to walk or not going to be able to talk. Most people will take this risk of 32 people getting better versus the one dying. Um, and so time is brain. Also, uh, this is kind of a nice representation of how important it is to give TPA early. So this was um, an analysis just recently of kind of everything we know, a uh, big meta-analysis of everything we know with the TPA trials to date. Um, looking at, on this line, uh, treatment time for the TPA uh, versus this line, the odds ratio of a good outcome. So that means two would mean you're two times more likely than nothing to have a good outcome. One means you're just as likely, so um, means the TPA didn't give you any benefit. Less than one actually means you're, you had a worse outcome than if we didn't do anything. So you don't want to be on this side of the, the chart down here. So your odds ratio is best uh, here at one hour, still you know pretty good up to three hours, 
all the way up to four and a half hours, you start seeing that the confidence interval starts getting pretty close to one. And then out here, you know, when people have given TPA out at six hours or beyond, you're not doing the patient any good. You could even make them worse. And that's because the stroke has probably mostly completed itself at that point, and all you're doing is adding risk of bleeding. So this is why um, the, we don't say we try to give TPA at three hours. We try to give TPA as early as possible. Um, here's another kind of cool way of showing the same thing. So as far as time being brain out of 100 patients, um, this is the number who either have benefit or harm because of the TPA. So if they get it within 90 minutes, you know, almost a third of patients have benefit. So this is even you know, higher than those other numbers. Um, and then, uh, and let's see, as far as harm, uh, you know, only 1.5 down at, at this range uh, has harm. And so they stratified it out uh, according to the time they get TPA. Um, once this is four and a half hours right here. Once you get beyond four and a half hours, you're actually more likely to cause harm than benefit, unfortunately. So um, all of this is kind of the basis for our target stroke times that all certified stroke centers try to adhere to. And we even set our own reach goals to be even better than this. But um, our goal is 10 minutes to the initial evaluation. So um, if a patient walks in through the door, um, we have 10 minutes to, sorry, let me turn this off, 10 minutes uh, for the provider to get in front of them to start evaluating the patient. If we're late on that time, if it's 20 minutes, everything else sort of falls apart. You can see it gets really hard to meet the rest of these times. Um, so these pre-arrival codes where we know the patient's coming in, we meet them, you know, at the door or on the ramp, it greatly expedites this process because we're at like one minute to initial evaluation, which is great. Um, and then within 15 minutes, the code stroke should be called. Again, in pre-arrivals, that's like a zero because it was code called on arrival. Um, and then we try to get our CAT scan done within uh, 25 minutes. The new guidelines say it's reasonable for most people to even shoot for 20. Um, get it interpreted, and then everybody should be trying to give TPA by 60 minutes, but they say even better to reach for 45. And our you know, goal is 45. Our average time to TPA at Salmon Creek last year in 2017 was 45 minutes for all comers that got TPA. So that's pretty darn good. Um, as far as what happens with the code stroke, once it's called, it alerts the ED physician, neurology pharmacy, the stroke coordinator, stat nurse, um, everybody who's going to be ready to manage that patient when they roll in the door, um, ready to get uh, stat uh, IV access or a second IV if they need one, uh, blood draw, do the NIH and get that CT. Um, so that, that's sort of TPA. And then moving on to uh, the new standard of care uh, for patients who can get it, mechanical thrombectomy. I had, I had a cool video, uh, but it doesn't work on a Mac. So I'll just have to describe it to you. Um, but so patients who have a large artery blocked by a blood clot, um, you know, large vessel occlusion, as we say, uh, can actually have it removed, as you know, with uh, these stent trevers. And so it's basically, you know, a, a metal mesh stent that is, uh, it's compacted, so it's very um, narrow, like just the width of the wire, and it's pushed through the clot and then deployed on the other side and then pulled back, and it drags the clot out. And then many of these devices have a combination of a, a penumbra or a little suction device that then kind of sucks the clot away. And um, that is highly effective for patients who can receive it. Um, so thrombectomy, zero to six hours. We had several landmark trials, five of them in 2015, um, showing that this is highly effective. Uh, it causes no um, difference in adverse outcome or hemorrhage, but there's a significant reduction in disability. Um, the number of patients you need to treat, that's you know, the number needed to treat to reduce your disability by one level on the Rankin score is only 2.6, um, which is very low. A lot of things we do in medicine, numbers need to treat, you know, the number needed to treat for aspirin preventing stroke is something like 30, and a lot of medications are up there. So only needing to treat 2.6 patients to make a difference in their disability is uh, very effective. Um, and so the guidelines now, according to this year's official guidelines, um, is that thrombectomy should be performed if the patient um, you know, has minimal pre-stroke disability. Obviously, if they're on a ventilator in a LTAC to begin with, you're not going to accomplish much. But if they have minimal pre-stroke disability, they have an internal carotid or proximal MCA occlusion, their NIH score is equal or greater to six, and their head CT is favorable, meaning they don't already have evidence of a big stroke, then it is standard of care that those patients should receive thrombectomy. 
Um, and that's uh, class one level A evidence, which is the highest it gets. Uh, and even in other patients, um, they may benefit as well. And at, at uh, Emmanuel, and we are doing thrombectomy for you know, other vessels as well, ACAs, PCAs, um, you know, even vertebral arteries, depending on the situation. And it's definitely reasonable to do that depending on uh, each case. And then kind of the, the latest and greatest news just presented at this year's stroke conference in February is that now this window has been extended for particular patients all the way up to 24 hours. So again, that tissue uh, dies very quickly as we saw with no blood flow. But in certain cases, patients are sort of hanging out in this balance of having a, one area that has completed the stroke and a whole other area that is at risk of stroke but hasn't quite died yet. That's the penumbra. And so these two trials used uh, perfusion studies to evaluate blood flow and look for patients who still had an area of compromised blood flow that hadn't died yet. And uh, they found that in patients who still had you know, a large area that could be saved or salvageable tissue, doing thrombectomy in this trial up to 16 hours or in, in this trial up to 24 hours was also highly effective with numbers needed to treat that were also very good, uh, 3 or 3.6. And these actually for getting back to functional independence, um, which is great. So um, as far as the late window at Legacy, you know, we don't at Salmon Creek do thrombectomy, but uh, we do at Emanuel, and we have CT perfusion and rapid software available there. If um, you know, a patient happens to walk in our front door with a large vessel occlusion, usually family drives them to the front of the ER with a large vessel occlusion, um, you know, we can identify that right away and transfer them to where they can get this done. But um, at Emanuel, we are doing uh, interventions up to 24 hours uh, based on the new guidelines, which are based on those two studies. We have the ability to get the CT perfusion scan, um, which is pictured here that shows you the non-contrast CT, the area of uh, severely limited blood flow, which is probably already dead, and the, severe, the area where there is still blood flow, but it's slow, and if you saved it, um, all this tissue could be prevented from having a stroke. Um, and so if they meet the criteria set forth in these uh, studies, we will do an intervention up to 24 hours, and we have been uh, fairly successful with these so far. And so it is now also standard of care, class one level A evidence to do this in patients with a favorable perfusion scan, six to 24 hours for ICA or MCA occlusions, and uh, lower level of evidence, but still can be considered for other arteries. And, and so we are um, kind of pushing the envelope and, and getting perfusion in non-ICA, MCA cases. And if it looks like there's something to save, regardless of where the stroke is, we're willing to do it. So I just wanted to leave you with one case. Um, just to show you how important this can be to patients. Um, this one was actually from, from last year, but uh, um, so this was a 71 year old uh, female who had AFib, um, suddenly presented with uh, aphasia, right sided weakness, um, face and arm weakness, aphasia, NIH scale was 11, um, and had this left MCA blockage on the CTA. You can see that this is the left MCA artery and it just stops right here. Um, Door to puncture time was 38 minutes to get her on the table to uh, go in after this blockage. This is the left MCA artery right here. And first pass, three minutes later, this is the left MCA artery right here. So this whole area would have died if, uh, if she hadn't gotten a thrombectomy. So this patient's NIH went from 11 to 3, and she was discharged home in two days. Um, Pre-rival code was called for this patient, rolled straight in the door, went straight to CT. That's how everything happens so quickly. So in summary, time is brain. Uh, you guys are the first line for stroke identification and triage to the appropriate center. Um, any acute, any sudden neurological deficit could be a stroke. Trust your instincts because the data shows that you're right most of the time. And pre-arrival codes, um, also getting that last known well and any information you can um, all really expedite treatment, which leads to better outcome. Time is brain, again. All right, that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. Any questions? Oh, um, yeah, well, actually, Christy, do you have uh, the most recent number on number of patients you mean who are getting TPA within 60 minutes?
Yeah. Yeah, our goal is to be, I'm not sure if this is actual or our goal, but our, our goal is 50% of patients get it and even under 45. And what percent, yeah, under 60, 100? Yeah. Yeah, if you're looking at both, if you're looking at under 60, we hit, I want to say it was like 86% last year. Yeah, yeah. That affects us at Salmon Creek in particular, as Christy showed. Most of our patients actually walk in through the front door, and so they haven't, you know, had any contact with the MS before they show up with us. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks again. Great. Uh, Thank you very much. I think I logged out. Okay, good. I'm looking at the boards. Basket of boards. Yeah. I want to take them last year, but they're only every two years. Uh huh. Okay. Let's see. So you're right here. Oh, down there. I looked up there. Not, yeah. Right there. Okay. Okay, I'm going to start. I'm going to start with uh, case three. Go back to case number two because it, it, it's a nice segue into uh, uh, the last set of slides. So, uh, on this uh, case review, uh, so this patient uh, dispatched code three for a chest pain uh, for a 60-year-old male, approximately 120 kilos, lying upon his bed in the back bedroom of a tight-quartered trailer at the campgrounds. Complains of chest pain, shortness of breath, started approximately one hour PTA and said, my defibrillator keeps warning me. That's probably a hint, right? The patient states he has an external defibrillator vest on due to his recent cardiac history. Stated he was admitted to OHSU in the beginning of July and recently discharged two weeks ago after being admitted for approximately one month. Stated he had six MIs in the month of July, had a stent placed, denied any recent illness, fever, or respiratory history over the last couple of weeks. Pale, diaphoretic, appeared lethargic, able to answer questions, vital signs unstable, low O2 sats in the upper 80s, 12 lead showed AFib, RVR with no STEMI. Patient placed on supplemental O2 with SATs improving due to very tight quarters and no space to extricate via tarp or stair chair. Assisted out to the gurney by ALS fire loaded, IV established, hypotensive, tachycardic, hypoglycemic. Known history of AFib and diabetes. So, known AFib. IV fluids along with dextrose given. External defibrillator alarmed twice in EMS present with no shock administered and transported code 3 to Peace Health. EKG shows AFib. Um, 
Heart rate, uh, pulse is 120, blood pressure 90, uh, pulse ox uh, is 88, uh, recheck pulse 138, known AFib, um, recheck pulse 120, blood pressure 100 over 42, got dextrose 20 grams IV, interesting number there. <coughs> During transport, patient's blood pressure improvement remained borderline hypotensive. Online medical control contacted and advised EMS to hold off on cardioversion. Why would we hold off on cardioversion? Exactly. Why is this guy, well, and besides that, how we know he's got AFib. He's had a history of AFib, so you don't, you know, if he, unless he's anticoagulated, we don't want to cardiovert him if, unless it's a dire emergency because you could throw a clot and stroke him. That's why we don't cardiovert immediately uh, if they're relatively stable. We don't know when they went into AFib. So administer low dose of diltiazem first and be cautious due to blood pressure being borderline. Well, yes, indeed, I agree with that. EMS followed Dr. Collins' orders and patient remained in AFib with rate bouncing between 110 and 140. Patient's blood pressure improved with continued IV fluids and IV pain meds. Patient stated his chest pain was improving and appeared to become more alert for EMS. Became hypotensive post pain meds, big surprise. IV fluids continued, CBD check, monitored, etc. Pain scale was 8 of 10, got some diltiazem, low dose of diltiazem for an, for an adult male, 10 milligrams. Uh, blood, pressure, uh, blood pressure stayed okay, actually went up. Blood glucose was low for a known diabetic, so you you know, treat at uh, 70, 80. Uh, got fentanyl, et cetera. So, we don't have the picture, it was definitely AFib. <sighs> Get out of that. So, this is a really complicated case. Uh, turns out to have bilateral pneumonia and sepsis. So, it's, so someone said, hey, maybe this is compensatory. Yeah, why would a person with known AFib have a rapid heart rate? Usually there's an underlying cause, and the first thing in your thing is to look for the underlying causes. So if, they, if they've got sepsis, um, uh, if they've got bleeding, if they had a GI bleed, or diarrhea and vomiting, you might think they're a little fluid short, they need to have some fluids before they have diltiazem. So, patient had bilateral pneumonia, sepsis, septic shock. Septic shock caused the RVR, it didn't cause the AFib. He was cardioverted times two in the ED, but, you know, still, it, he still had to be on pressors to maintain his blood pressure. Um, he also had four fractured ribs. We don't know what that was from. He denied, he denied any illness, but he had apparently been coughing. Now, whether he coughed hard enough to break a rib is a good trick. I don't think cardioversion did it. He was still in the hospital uh, when, when, I, when I did this review, but I've since looked at it, and he has, he has been discharged needs to follow up with um, um, OHSU and he's going to have a uh, 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 an internal pacemaker put in so that he doesn't have to keep wearing his 
uh, thing. Now, his cardiac history is beyond scary. I mean, he did indeed have six MIs uh, all at the same time. He had the first one and went in and had a stent. The stent occluded. They had to go in and clear that out, put a new one. They put another one in. Then he went and he had a couple of cardiac arrests during that hospitalization. He really was in the hospital for a month with all these things. But so he's got AFib, but really needed to have his, um, and he did turn out to be anticoagulated, so which is why they could ab able to cardiovert him, but we didn't know that at first. Any rate, um, he needed fluids and he needed glucose to start with, and uh, probably didn't get quite enough of that. But a low dose controlled medical control consult to get the diltiazem. Going to go back to number two now, and then I'll just keep moving around here. This is a very fascinating one. To, I mean, it's another scare. This is a code three for possible stroke. 64-year-old female, conscious, sitting upright in a chair at the medical office. She's in a medical office. She walked in for th back therapy while she was filling out the paperwork. She dropped the clipboard and couldn't move her left side. They called 911, right, figuring this was unusual. Uh, so, I mean, the onset of symptoms were about 10 minutes before arrival. Staff say the patient walked in the clinic with no distress and no symptoms, denied any history of AFib or cardiac problems. Left facial droop and drooling, so what artery is involved? And she has arm weakness, MCA. Now, now we're not going to require you to figure that out before you come in. Like, you know, you can tell me if he's got a, if she's having an inferior MI, but based on criteria, but I don't expect you to tell me all those things. She knew her name, where she was, but not what happened, what year it was, so she's got a little aphasia in there, too. Move patient stretcher, transported code three to medical center. Now, she was, no, she was found to be an AFib with a, well, we'll see in a minute, fairly rapid heart rate. Contacted online medical control to see if he wanted diltiazem to be given to slow the heart rate. Diltiazem was given with improvement in the rate. Patient continued in AFib and continued to be strokey. During transport, she started to move her left arm a little bit, still had no grip. So there's her underlying rate and rhythm. And then after DILT, no real change. Blood pressure is 132 over 83, so she's certainly managing fine with that. Um, it's what's the what's the likelihood? You know, so when you're when you're making these kind of adjust, what's her what's her her heart rate's 180. She's AFib. She's got no history of AFib, and she was perfectly normal when she walked in to the doctor's office. So what's the chance of her stroke being from the AFib, or what's the chance of the AFib do being due to the stroke? Okay. Pulse ox is 98. Uh, she's got a little fluids. AFib slowed a little bit to about 150-ish uh, with the with the diltiazem. In the hospital, left MCA thrombus, and she went and had a thrombectomy. She has a cardiomyopathy underlying all this. She was placed on a dilt drip for rate support, but. Really, she began, she never, they could never, 
successfully wean her from ventilation. She needed all with assistance for ventilation, probably due to brainstem involvement with that MCA stroke, which is probably what caused the AFib too. Although she does have underlying cardiomyopathy, which might throw it off. She, because they could never successfully wean her from the from ventilatory support, uh, she requested her, her medical care was through uh, Kaiser, so she requested transfer to Sunnyside, and she was going to um, refuse long-term ventilation. And anyway, I've since found out that she is deceased. So this gets me into Diltaism. <laughs> Care and your protocols. What treatment do I have for atrial fibrillation? The answer is none. I have treatment for atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter with rapid ventricular response. But there is no treatment for atrial fibrillation per se in your orders because that's not something EMS is supposed to do. Now we treat symptomatology and we treat, we, we treat rapid ventricular response if it's symptomatic. And if it's truly symptomatic to the point of being uh, uh, critical for the patient or unstable for the patient, then the treatment of either one, uh, of any rapid ventricular response is uh, cardioversion. Now, For supraventricular narrow complex tachycardias, atrial fib or flutter, they're not hypotensive, have rapid ventricular rate, and they're symptomatic, but not, not critical. Uh, do a 12 lead, and the order is for diltiasm 0.25, given over two minutes, and can, after 15 minutes can repeat at 0 0.35, which is a maximum of 25 milligrams. Alternative would be verapamil if we're out of uh, diltiazem. Caution if the patient's already on a beta blocker. Caution, well, I'd like you to use this with narrow, narrow complex SVT, no wide complex tachycardias. Don't use if the patient is known to be WPW or if you can easily identify delta waves. If they're hypotensive after the use of any calcium channel blocker, we give them a little calcium gluconate and some fluids. Usually they respond to fluids. So PSVT, I don't want you to do vagal maneuvers first. Um, and if PSVT, and then uh, adenocard, and then if PSVC persists despite adenocard, or if it turns out that your PSVT is really a flutter or a fib, it's revealed by the adenocard, then to consider use of diltiazem if they're not hypotensive. Um, and if it's not a wide complex. Now, I've been unhappy over a few. Now, first of all, I will make a confession: is that I haven't been, I haven't been following the diltiazem use as carefully as I should. So, um, I have since been correcting this, and I've now reviewed almost all of the cases of diltiazem use over the last year, and for. Camus, it's about 17 cases for uh, which uh, of which three of them occur in the same person, 
uh, and uh, in uh, for AMR we're up to uh, there about a hundred and fifty cases over the last year and anyway re been reviewing these and for North Country as well and um, there's been an unfortunate use of diltiazem in some wide complex cases uh, although we've not had any direct problem from that because uh, they're really old people who have wide complex probably on the basis of atrial fibrillation with aberrant conduction and has nothing to do with WPW syndrome because you should have known by the time you're 85 you should know if you've got WPW or not you know um, or someone should know that uh, but there's been there's been a, uh, a a bunch of cases of what I would call the uh, the the therapeutic imperative, which means if you have a drug available, you're going to use it. And having that drug in your pocket takes takes precedence over thinking about what's going on with the patient. For example, one of the cases was uh, a person who'd had nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea for two and a half weeks and has a heart rate of 170, happens to be chronically AFib, and of course the first drug going into the patient is diltiazem. Well, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, the first thing to go in the patient should be some fluids to replace the fluid loss. So I originally had threatened uh, that I was going to take diltiazem out of the uh, uh, out of your uh, compendium with our new our new thing. But I've I've since reconsidered and have, have had some discussions. You know, going over the haven't finished the final. Thing. I've noticed that in many cases, at least uh, about a third or more of the cases that the the medic has talked to medical control anyway and we may I may just put diltiazem on a discuss with medical control before using it basis uh, or there may be some specific cases where I would allow it to be used but the basic thing if the patient is so critical that you have to do something then that patient needed to be cardioverted. If the patient is not that critical, you should be able to make a phone call to have a have a discussion. So, um, we'll be we'll be deciding this over the next month or so. All right. See, I was up to case three, case four. Okay, case four. Code three on a 50-year-old with a breathing problem. Patient's mother on scene saying she was asleep, asleep and woke up to the patient breathing extremely loudly and quickly. Mother states the patient has never breathed this loudly. Now, you gotta understand that there's probably, we probably have an issue here already that's hidden in that you've got a 50-year-old guy who's living with his mother. No, I mean, so, I mean, even though that gets to be, I've even seen a couple TV ads now where the kid moves back in, you know, and he's in his 40s. Uh, but uh, in this case, there is an underlying thing, which you can, so. Mother says she's been out of town for the weekend. It's possible the patient hasn't been receiving his medications. So the kid is, you know, the 50-year-old is taking chronic medications. Mother says she has not seen the patient seize tonight. Well, there it is. And has been years since his last seizure. Mother's unable to state why the patient has a trache tracheostomy, but states the patient received the trach in the ICU this March for an infection of some sort. Patient says, help me repeatedly and no repeatedly when EMS attempts to help. So it confused, help me, and then pushes you away kind of thing. Found patient standing in the bathroom, 
tripoding over the sink. He's altered and not responsive to EMS. He has frothy blood dripping out of his mouth and in onto his chest. He has loud strider and a heavy work of breathing. Blood is noted on the floor of the patient's bedroom, but no object is noted having blood on it where he may have struck his face. Patient initially pushes away EMS, being as wandering from room to room, pushing away EMS and his own mother whenever present. After attempting to herd the patient to the gurney, patient returns to the bathroom and begins mumbling. Patient begins fumbling with his trach and aggressively pulls it out, leaving the exposed stoma. Now, so I'd say we're, I'd say we're into the altered mental status somewhere, but what do you think the likely altered mental status of this patient is? Hypoxic. Yeah, he's hypoxic, and what else? Yes, he probably has had a seizure. He was breathing funny, loudly, but mother never, and now he's post-ictal and hypoxic. Minor bleeding is noted from the stoma, uh, increase in oral secretions, wanders back to the kitchen, is finally herded onto the gurney, was able to sit in the tripod. Trachea suction, when sitting patient becomes more articulate with EMS, eventually able to rotate to the gurney, is moved to the EMS. While being loaded, he has a full body seizure <laughs> and becomes incontinent. Patient's extremities and face become cyanotic during seizure. So now he's now um, he got some. So at that point, he gets some midazolam. Syringe malfunction while administered medication, approximately half of the dose wasted. It's apparently squirted out. Um, com he got four point restraints. Uh, then he got, uh, he's got suction. He got some more midazolam. Um, CO was 20. Um, Shyly trach placement is attempted but unsuccessful due to inflammation of the patient's stoma. Stoma suctioned, uh, more frank and frank blood is removed. Patient administered second dose of Verseb. Airway is temp patient is transported code three to legacy during transport. An ET tube is placed in the patient's stoma with ETCO2 reading from it. SpO2 is noted low but improves rapidly with suction. O2 strider ceases. Patient becomes increasingly more lethargic during transport, generally indicating that he's getting some oxygen, perhaps, although his CO2 may be going up. Uh, maybe the Versed is taking, you know, finally taking place. Continues to maintain respiratory drive. Um, significant improvement in rate and work of breathing. Patient arrives with improvement unloaded. All right. So. Strider was, was w resolved with the placement of the tube. So, from legacy, strong work by crew, yeah, especially uh, having to uh, uh, go through a, this 50 year old man, history of glottic stenosis, epilepsy, had a seizure, pulled out his tracheostomy in post ictal phase. Medic placed a 60 tube. The tube was a little deep, but it functioned well. Ultimately, got uh, treated for status, epileptic, and ED went to the OR for trach replacement because he couldn't put even a 4-0 Shiley in in the ED because the trach was too swollen. Uh, he was admitted doing well at that point. This is a couple weeks ago now. So excellent work, hard to manage a patient like that. Um, my only other thought is we could have given it, we could have with this patient wandering around like that, we could have started the, um, uh, the Verset, you know, this is clearly either, either a status or a, a with an in-between period of, of uh, uh, post-ictal phase, you know, post-ictal going right into another seizure is kind of a status kind of thing. You might have considered um, Versed I am. It does work, um, although um, as long as we had the IV in, great. <laughs> 
Pa now, another seizure patient, neural patients here. 49-year-old female called 911 dispatch because she felt a seizure coming on and wanted fire dispatched to her residence. Dispatcher said she was on the phone with the patient when the patient started seizing. She heard the patient hit the floor and then describe what sounded like something hitting the floor hard several times and then the patient stopped responding. Patient's fiance arrived on scene, uh, said the patient had a traumatic head injury, which leads to seizures, cluster headaches, and blood clots. Upon arrival, patient found unresponsive, still seizing. IV established, got five of her said, stopped seizure activity, started to respond to verbal stimuli. Patient informed us she had severe neck, face, and right hip pain. Manual cervical stabilization maintained, cervical collar put on, patient secured, uh, long spinal board with spider straps and head immobilizer, had good CSM in all four extremities, did have some deformity in the right hip with some internal, what appeared to be internal rotation, patient uh, also had swelling and severe pain to the right zygoma and jaw, patient was trauma alerted, transported code three, so nicely done, I mean, to the point recognized the patient, well, the patient wakes up and complains of it, but apparently went down hard, so has to be cervical spine, spine precautions to start with, uh, transported on a board. Um, it's one of the few, one, one of the times that really is indicated to, you know, do all that spinal, spinal motion restriction. This new term is not spinal immobilization because you really can't do spinal immobilization, but spinal motion restriction. And she, she's evaluated with the trauma surgeon along with the neurologist for her stroke. So um, dispatch was interesting. And dispatch was pretty interesting because she stayed um, stayed on the phone and was able to communicate all these numbers. Uh, I mean, all the fact that she had perhaps three or four seizures, all violent, ongoing, a lot of noise. Um, and she hadn't fractured a hip, it turned out. Um, she hadn't fractured her jaw and eye. Um, uh, she was transferred to code three. She was a trauma alert. She was totally evaluated from that. So a good case. Um, grand mal seizures can be really violent. And she went from a standing position right into a seizure. So she could have hit something out down. So uh, ground level falls uh, are, can be pretty, pretty significant because there's no way to protect or cushion yourself from the fall if you're having a seizure. So uh, the dispatcher was pretty impressive. We're gonna, we, if we haven't already, we'll give, her, we'll give them a uh, kudos to the, to the dispatch for staying on the line. Um, patient was as a trauma alert. Uh, she had no internal bleeding, no head bleed, and no fractures. Multiple contusions and bruises she was on Coumadin for a deep vein thrombosis, so amazingly she didn't have a head bleed or anything else with that. Um, so all the more lucky. So it was an excellent fire EMS response. Um, they weren't sidetracked by just treating the seizure, but the rest of the potentials for that patient. So it's a good case. Okay, I think, does anybody have any questions? Concerns, other thoughts? All right. Dr. Lover? Yes. You mean, you mean the, the funeral home? Funeral home. <laughs> the funeral home. Yeah. Uh, and when the family calls the funeral home, the funeral home says, we can't just come up and pick up any dead body. I have to get clearance from the ME. And so calling back the ME, the MEs have said, that's not our job to call the funeral home. It's like, well, we're in, a, we're in a rotating circle here. You need to call the funeral home and say, yes, you're not coming out here. It's OK. Dead body. And uh, the last four I've had, the 
circuitous. Huh? Is there is there any particular person you've been talking to down there? And and it's and and if the and if the funeral homes don't know that the family can call them. Yeah, the funeral home says, "Hey, I I mean, I, it was just two weeks ago. I talked to the funeral home again. And he says, hey, you got to know where I'm coming from. I said, you can't just call me up and say, hey, I got a dead body in the bushes. Come get him.'" <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, but it can't be a real change if they haven't told the funeral homes that. So, well, I guess we'll make the phone call and find out. Okay. All right. Next month is uh, skills. Unless we do protocol changes. Okay. <laughs>